We've uncovered a number of secretive government units that claim to be fighting misinformation and disinformation. Actually, they're monitoring and recording people that are criticising the government and government policies. The 77th Brigade had these kind of conspiracy theories around it, like, is there, are they watching us online, controlling what we say? I don't think anyone really took it seriously. We weren't even actually looking into the unit until a whistleblower came forward to us. What the whistleblower told us is that there uh, were absolutely no safeguards or controls in place whatsoever to prevent uh, this monitoring affecting people in Britain mm -hmm. and, that, and that it was affecting people in Britain. They were doing general searches on social media in English language on topics that Johnson government was interested in. We were being surveilled by our own military. We are in the process of winning a campaign against GPS ankle tags for um, innocent campaigners, you know, people that haven't even broken the law. If they're what? deemed disruptive, um, you could be fitted with a GPS ankle tag uh, to monitor where you go and make sure that you don't go to well, other protests. Well, you haven't broken the law and they're going to track your movement. Yeah. If even the Russians or the Chinese, I say, we're going to ankle tag our protesters, you'd be like, wow, they've really gone for it now. You know, like mm. this is really extreme. And this is happening in, in Britain. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantin Kisson. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. Our brilliant guest today is a friend of the show uh, who brings us troubling news. She's the director of Big Brother Watch here in the UK, which has just produced this report, Ministry of Truth, which talks quite a bit about the government surveillance of people who have wrong opinions. Silky Carla, welcome back. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, so everyone can go back and watch our first interview if you, they want a backstory on you and whatever, but you're the director of Big Brother Watch, which is a civil liberties organization here in the UK. You've just uh, released a report uh, that is really, really worrying. Tell us about it. Yeah, so we've uncovered a number of secretive government units that claim to be fighting misinformation and disinformation. And um, they've been very resistant to transparency. So over a long time, we've been investigating them and we found that actually they're monitoring and recording people that are criticizing the government and government policies. Um, and we found that this was particularly active during the pandemic but that we think that they're active on other topics. And it's particularly affecting uh, members of parliament, uh, journalists, academics, experts, and campaigners. Um, so, you know, not the uh, kind of boogeyman, Russian disinformation, bot farms, or whatever it is that the government would have us believe that these units are working on. You're off the hook, Mike. <laughs> well, probably not, actually. I mean, one of the things you mentioned to us is we could we could see if we are in included in that. I imagine we would be, actually, given that the people that you were talking about, quite a lot of them we've had on the show, you know, Toby Young, Julie Hartley Brewer uh, and others, right? Yeah, um, they're people who have big followings on social mm. media in particular. That's what the government seemed to be interested in. Um, they're also interested in alternative platforms. So, for example, one of the documents we have um, describes Parler as a threat, and that was when it had just launched. Mm. Um, and the government were interested in senior politicians who had gone onto that platform, and they're you know recording the fact that they've gone onto that platform. Um, so, yeah, when they are collecting um, posts that people have uh, put online, they're also looking at engagement. So that's why, you know, a show like this and people like your guests are quite likely to be, um, you know, in the crosshairs, really, because they're looking at people who are talking about controversial topics and looking at then the engagement rates. So they're literally recording numbers of retweets and this sort of thing. And what are they doing with this information? Because one of the things that uh, people might say is, well, like the government, I mean, anyone can monitor anything. You know, what's, what's wrong with noticing who's tweeted what and how many likes they got? Mm. It's, uh, so two things. Um, in essence, it is censorship and propaganda. Mm -hmm. um, the units in question claim to uh, work with the tech companies to flag things that might breach their terms of service mm -hmm. or that are inappropriate. 
And we've even had ministers say this in the House of Commons. But the problem is that people have just assumed that it's all this nasty stuff that in question. And so everyone's kind of congratulated it. Now we know it's basically dissent. Um, so taking stuff down or uh, pressuring social media companies to take stuff down. And the other part of it is, I think, understanding the public conversation so that the government can respond. And that could be through um, trying to work with their SEO to get their search results up higher in search engines on key topics, especially around the pandemic, or issuing rebuttals to newspapers or social media users, um, basically to amplify their point of view in response. And I mean, that's the element of it that you can say is reasonable, whether it's proportionate mm. to be uh, keeping records and tabs on dissidents, I would say is probably not. Um, but the element of this kind of collusion of state and big tech power to silence people for lawful opinions should really make everyone shudder. I um, completely agree with you. And how long has this been going on for, Silke? Um, all of the units but one that we've identified were started during the Conservative government. Um, but most of them have been in really recent years, since around 2018. But the pandemic was absolutely the catalyst for it really taking off. So the central unit that is responsible for most of this is the counter disinformation unit. That's what it's called, mm -hmm. although we haven't seen much of them, uh, them doing much around disinformation. Um, it sits within the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like a policy unit. You know, they, they're, they're not spooks, um, but they're acting in that way. Um, they had started this unit actually um, in 2019, I think it was, during elections. And then it was stood down. And then um, during the pandemic, it was stood up again. And now it's permanent. Um, and it's folding in other kind of disinformation specialists from across government to feed into this central unit. The other thing that happened, you know, and I think important to bear in mind that the pandemic was, you know, it was the blank check for a massive extension of powers across the piece, really, in government. And so uh, the birth of some of the activity um, that we saw during the pandemic was actually in this secretive army unit called the 77th Brigade. The 77th Brigade had these kind of conspiracy theories around it, like, is there, are they watching us online and controlling what we say? And it, it, I don't think anyone really took it seriously. We weren't even actually looking into the unit until a whistleblower came forward to us mm -hmm. and told us what was really going on during the pandemic within that unit. Um, the public statements from the army were that the 77th Brigade were sort of stood up during you know the beginning in March 2020, um, and that they were dealing with foreign disinformation. Mm -hmm. And in response to questions about would you ever do anything domestically, of course not. All of our operations are directed overseas. Um, what the whistleblower told us is that there uh, were absolutely no safeguards or controls in place whatsoever to prevent. Uh, this monitoring affecting people in Britain, mm -hmm. um, and that and that it was affecting people in Britain. They were doing general searches on social media in English language um, on topics that Johnson government was interested in. Um, so you know, basically trying to gauge public opinion, see what people were thinking about different elements of COVID and the policies. Uh, and then they were collating these reports, including of individuals. We saw even a university student, you know, someone that doesn't have a big following. They're just collating these records of mm. uh, what people were, were saying and thinking and then sending those up to central government. Silky, why did it explode over the pandemic? Was it because more and more people were online, so there was an opportunity to do that? This was going to be the moment? Was it because they were genuinely worried about misinformation being spread during the pandemic and as a result, people potentially dying? I think all of these things can be true at the same mm. time. Um, of course, people were worried about um, public health obviously during the pandemic. Of course, people were. Um, but, you know, does recording what a university student is worried about, mm -hmm. um, you know, about the virus, that's not saving lives, is it? You know, it, that I think actually what one, an interesting thing that the whistleblower said was that um, 
there had been a desire for the army to demonstrate this information ops capability. Um, and the 77th Brigade describes itself as involved in non-lethal engagement mm -hmm. for modern warfare against adversaries. Um, and so, you know, you think of these kind of sophisticated overseas operations, but they were interested in demonstrating to government that we can do these kind of elite information ops. Mm -hmm. And so it was an attractive thing to say, we can deal with the dangerous misinformation and disinformation, which I think we now have to be honest, and especially in light of our report, there is a moral panic about it mm -hmm. and it's overblown. And now we need to have a sober conversation mm -hmm. about what we really mean when we're talking about misinformation and disinformation, because what the army got away with in this instance was an accumulation of resources to do basically nothing, nothing worthwhile. Um, but that does have a serious impact on Brits and meant that we were being surveilled by our own military, you know, with military power. It's extraordinary, really. Um, and so I think that so there's a, a few things that, that, that and this happened after 9-11 as well, didn't it? You know, the desire for certain elements within the uh, military industrial complex um, and business and government to show that they can uh, with the with more resources, they can provide these new services and do these new things with civil liberties put really to the side. Mm. Um, so that was going on. And of course, I think the overriding thing, the fundamental thing that I hope we're now thinking about more clearly is that governments will always try to accumulate power and having power over information is the most extraordinary power you can have. If you can, can strongly influence and even control what people are able to say to each other, what people are able to see and hear and read, um, especially when it comes to criticism of, of your own policies, you know, for a government, really, for an authoritarian government, that's the dream. And that's really the territory that we're now on the precipice of. And the disturbing thing is that so many people in the liberal establishment um, are actually calling for this. They want the misinformation units to do more, be more active, be more present, mm -hmm. and to scrub the internet of wrong ideas. And if people think you're exaggerating, I had a fascinating experience being on Question Time last week because they have this question that they do before that isn't broadcast. And it was about whether Donald Trump should have been allowed back on Facebook and Instagram. And <sighs> I, I don't have the words to describe to you how people think. I think some people have got themselves into a position where they don't, they've forgotten that old, uh, there's no solutions, only trade-offs thing. And they don't think that there are trade-offs to pursuing maximum safety online. And so there was this, uh, the labor woman next to me, for example, she was like, I think this country should be leading the world in what we control in terms of people saying online. And, like, and because it wasn't on camera, I didn't say anything, but it's like, do we want to compete with China and North Korea? Is that, is that what, and a lot of people in that audience as well, that, that's how people think now, safety, I want safety. And they think that safety doesn't have a cost. Mm. How, how do we how do we communicate about this? It's it's actually terrifying, and it's terrifying. It's happened so quickly. Um, both that people have become complacent about their liberty in that way. You know, when you're saying that you want to shut someone else up for lawful speech, I'm not talking about Trump in particular, but mm. this whole kind of um, culture that you're referring to. You're also saying you're happy to be shut up for things that you might say that are lawful and that your friends can, your communities can. Um, the death of speech is the death of ideas. If you have a society without dissent and without free speech, you're, it's a graveyard. It's a graveyard of dying ideas where we will never progress, we will never move forward. And I do think there is like a intellectual poverty in all of this as well, because when people are resorting to silencing others, they're saying that they don't have the capacity to reason with them and mm -hmm. they don't believe in the strength of ideas and conversation and debate and discussion to reach truths. You know, truths are now things that are dictated from an elite, you know, back to, we're back to kind of priesthood. Mm. And you've got like the likes of Mariana Spring at the BBC, the disinformation reporters and so on, who are like the priests and the priestesses of truth. 
it's so bizarre um mm. in my view but in also just the kind of post enlightenment view of free speech you just have f the, the most open forum possible is the way that you achieve um rationality and truth and discovery and progress you're arguing but this yeah. is kind of the point that we've come to where i don't think th people th a lot of people think about it that way at all th th free speech has become a thing uh, that people who don't want progress apparently use, right? So if you if you say I'm pro free speech, that means you don't want progress. How, how's that happened? I don't know. I don't know. You <laughs> need to really work on the branding of free speech because, yeah, exactly. Free speech is a, is is about um, it's about progress. It's about movement. It's the thing that led to gay rights, to women's mm. rights to all the rights that we have, you know, are achieved through being able to speak truth to power. Um, and I think the pandemic was really killer for this because mm. it was, the, the idea was perpetuated that, you know, just for now, actually free speech and these dangerous ideas can, can kill people, you know, and it's, mm. and we need to save lives. So shut up, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's reflected, I think, in the work that these units were doing, these disinformation units. Um, blank check, no oversight. Politicians de didn't even have curiosity about what they were doing. No one was asking the questions. And we've had to dig, dig and dig to find what I'm afraid was probably inevitable, mm -hmm. that when you allow you know, resources to accumulate in the shadows, um, then they will be serving the interests of the powerful, not of the public. That just seems obvious, but obviously, you know, that is what we've now found. And uh, something needs to be done about it. I mean, actually, these units need to be shut down. You can't have senior politicians being spied on by their own government for wrong think. Um, look, I, when I was reading through the report, I couldn't quite believe it. But then I thought, of course I can believe it. And the particular thing that I found very believable was the collusion between government and big tech, mm. because we've seen it with the Twitter files, which Elon Musk released. And you start to really, really worry where you think, like, anything that I say online could report be reported back. And not only could it mean that somebody could lose their job, it means that the government is then tracking them that's like something out of soviet russia yeah it is um and there's been quite a lot of like pinch myself moments during mm. this um i think particularly when you know so to give some examples of the people affected uh david davis mm. mp who has been a member of parliament for decades very well known civil libertarian a senior within the conservative party who of course in government an ex-minister um, and he, his position during the pandemic was uh, he praised the vaccine rollout. He spoke a lot about vaccines, um, and he, but he was very critical of mandatory domestic vaccine passports, as of course we were. We did a massive campaign on it. As um, we were. As you were, as all the sensible people were. <laughs> we were probably all on the list. Yeah. 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 Uh, and he, and he, the fact that he did you know, is really quite extraordinary. Um, actually, this was a mainstream political mm. opinion. Um, the parliamentary rebellion against vaccine passports was the biggest rebellion since uh, the vote on the Iraq war in parliament. And this was a big, big deal politically. Mm. Um, why should he be being recorded by disinformation units for actually giving fact-based criticisms mm. of the vaccine passport scheme. And let's not forget, who were the purveyors of disinformation during this period? Because a lot of people were saying vaccine passports were going to save lives. Mm. They were absolutely critical. We can't go out without them um, and all the rest of it. We found out in our legal challenge that we did um, we did two against the Welsh government and the English and the UK government um, on vaccine passports that they had no evidence mm. that they were going to have any uh, measurable impact on public health. And we have that in writing. Um, and yet we were told such a different story. So, you know, it's these kinds of things where you think, yeah, this is getting a bit... Um, you know, what d democracy is really falling apart here. Another example, um, it was Carl Hennigan, Professor Carl Hennigan mm. from mm. Oxford University, Centre for Evidence-Based uh, Medicine. 
this is someone that surely we want to be listening to during a well, pandemic. They were. <laughs> <laughs> they were. That's true, a bit too much. Um, but um, to put him in a disinformation report, yeah. um, mm. you know, he's an expert. His, uh, he was taken off Twitter for a period. Mm. Uh, his studies were marked as false by Facebook, but again, by these, you know, like people that c could not compete with uh, Fr Fred Carl Hennigan in terms of his expertise. It's absolutely absurd. And the fact that both of these people are in these government reports um, and that we know also they were being censored. David Davis had a video taken off YouTube. Um, the speech that he gave against vaccine passports that we put on our channel, on Big Brother Watch's channel, was taken off YouTube until we complained and got it put back on. Um, we weren't able to get the correspondence between these units and the social media companies. They also won't tell us how many times they flagged stuff. Uh, no information whatsoever. So something very useful that Elon Musk could do would be disclose all of the communications between the British government mm. and Twitter um, during the pandemic. And let's get to the bottom of this. Do you not have a certain sympathy, I can't believe I'm saying these words, for the social media companies when you think... You, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic where you had David Icke getting millions of views for things that were palpable nonsense. And then moving forward, then you have the government pressing down on them. You have people saying that they're platforming misinformation. Weren't they in many ways between a rock and a hard place as well? Yeah, they're totally not prepared mm. for, they, they weren't prepared for that kind of a challenge. Um, but in my view, the easiest thing for them to do would be to follow the laws of the country that they operate in mm. and then choose what countries they operate in. So, you know, it's not, against the law to spout nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really easy to deal with. Um, and I do worry as well that if, for example, you've got people that are, uh, say, spreading conspiracy theories about 5G masts or mm -hmm. this kind of thing, um, if you just silence those people, what do the people who are interested in the ideas do and where do they go and what do they then think? But you had to silence it. Is it that dangerous? You know, are these ideas so you know, you'll either think, yeah, it's dangerous because it's wrong, or you'll think it's dangerous because you don't want me to know it for some reason. Mm -hmm. I think the best way of challenging nonsense or falsehoods of any type, and I mean from fringe people all the way up to the stuff, some of the stuff that gets printed in the mainstream press, is more speech. Mm -hmm. um, and to just suppress it and silence it means that it will just grow and cultivate in another part of society or the internet um, where um, there's a, probably a less rational discussion. So, Keith, are you concerned that you've just uncovered the tip of the iceberg here? Because I would imagine if I was a powerful person in government and I've identified a Toby Young or a Julia Hartley Brewer or a Professor Carl Hennigan or a David Davis who's, who's annoying me and not allowing me to do the things that I'm doing for public health, quote unquote, I'd quite want to know what they're sending to each other in their Telegram groups mm. and their WhatsApp chats and their text messages and what they're saying on their voicemails and on their phone calls. Is there any suggestion that that was going on? Uh, we have absolutely no idea. But um, I think the fact that we are finding such extreme activity so low down the scale mm -hmm. within government policy units um, makes you think, well, it makes what me was think, going I'm on? You. Yeah, yeah, it does. What was going on in GCHQ? Mm. What was going on in MI5? Mm. Um, we they have extraordinary powers to do uh, exactly what you're talking about. You know, to hack phones and to intercept calls and messages and all the rest of it. Uh, we spoke last time I was here about mm. those powers mm -hmm. um, at length, um, and you know, public health is in law, one of the reasons uh, that, um, you know, governments can sometimes intrude on your privacy mm -hmm. or intrude on your right to freedom of expression. Um, but it's about proportionality. And so who knows? We need probably more whistleblowers. It's an interesting aspect of the work of the 77th Brigade, in my view, and based on some people that I've spoken to, is that, um, yes, it's concer really concerning what they were doing. I mean, just searching all of the internet, 
clearly impacting people at home, clearly mm. with policy direction from number 10 to look at things that number 10 was interested in. But um, it was also a bit of a distraction mm -hmm. and meant that people were, especially before we found out what we've just found out, some people were, um, uh, I guess, building conspiracy theories around what the 77th Brigade were doing. And the name is kind of spooky, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 77th yeah. Brigade, you know, what are they up to? Um, but then people weren't talking about where the power really lies. And actually, mm -hmm. an interesting aspect of what the whistleblower tells us is that they had no their resources were crap. They had nothing. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have been able to find disinformation if they'd been desperate to because they didn't have the resources, they didn't have the skills even. Um, and, you know, the whistleblower suspects that there was foreign disinformation being spread at the time, um, some of which, you know, other people have written about, mm -hmm. perhaps stuff coming from China, for instance, um, and that they would have had absolutely no chance of finding it. So where does the power really lie to be doing some of this stuff and you know that would be in GCHQ and MI5 and based on what we know about their activities over the years and their interest in um, uh, politics you know a lot of this report and our mm. investigation has strong echoes of reds under the bed that we saw in the 80s where um, UK intelligence agencies were really interested in um, you know, political surveillance, what union activists were up to mm. and what leftists were up to more broadly, as you had McCarthyism in the US for the same kind of thing. Um, so the intelligence agencies have formed for this. And wouldn't it be the fact that during a pandemic, um, you know, we're, we're, this kind of uh, sense of crisis that they would be highly active during that period if policy units were? Yeah, I think so. Silky. So, isn't part of the problem that we're here talking and we're talking about the government and I'm thinking, ah, there's a general election in a couple of years, we're gonna we're gonna vote these bastards out, it's gonna be fine. And then I remember that then it's a Labour coming in and they're even more insane about this. Yeah, well <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, the, the, the conversation around misinformation and disinformation, I think to some degree hasn't happened yet. And around mm. free speech generally, it has been really poor. On the online safety bill, for instance, you know, mm. we've got this regulation coming through at the moment, which is about precisely what, you know, the person you were sitting next to at question time was talking about controlling speech on the Internet, mm. lawful speech. Mm. Um, so and it's both Tory and Labour. I mean, the, the, yeah. the Tory guy was like, you know, we've been too slow to catch up with a wave of hate online. Mm. That's how they frame it. Yeah. It's, and, and look, I, I think we should acknowledge that the internet and the ability to communicate in that scale poses new challenges. There is no question about that because I think the, the example you gave, mate, was actually a really good one. David Icke at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, if you get to a point where somebody can go on a YouTube show or even on a private platform of some kind and say stuff, and then an hour later people are burning down 5G masts, I can see why a government would feel the need to to do something about that. And you have stories of kids who see suicide material and end up, mm. you, you, know, you know, like there's bad outcomes. So you can you can see what why that would be an issue. But but it's just it seems to me that a lot of people don't realize that there are trade offs here that have to be really carefully watched. And on the online harms bill did get watered down a little bit, didn't it? Yeah, can I just come back on that? Okay, yeah, yeah, there, sure. are, there are trade offs on on a lot of what happened during the pandemic, mm. people were made to be, by the government, mm. to be scared for their, you know, really, really mm. scared. Yes. Not leaving that. People still have mental health problems from this. Mm -hmm. I, I was at a dinner with someone recently who said that their wife hadn't left their loft for months, so, you know, because they were isolating and scared to come out of the house. You know, there are a lot of people that have been badly affected yeah. by this. And look, we still don't know, by the way, whether lockdown saved lives or not. They may have, over a period of time, ended yeah. up costing more lives than they saved. So I agree with you. There's still a big fallout. Of yeah. course, you've got mm -hmm. Sweden to look, you know, mm. we just look at Sweden on that maybe. But um, yeah, I mean, big, big questions that are still clearly being um, answered. And so, you know, yes, of course, you know, with some extreme fringe speech, 
there can be thing there can be outcomes we can link to it but actually we just lived through an extraordinary government propaganda period mm -hmm. that also had terrible terrible impacts on a lot of people whilst by the way they were having piss ups in 10 downing street mm -hmm. you know so <clears throat> the behaviors of the people that were behind this were totally contradicting the way that other people were made to feel mm. um and so trust is dis disintegrating um, and part, you know, one of the reasons that this matters so much and that we can't put down all these social ills to just like people spreading disinformation and misinformation online, someone's gone out and attacked a 5G mask because they read a tweet. Mm. I think it's more complicated than that. I think mm. trust in authority is totally disintegrating and people don't really trust in the mainstream press in the same way. They don't trust their governments. Mm. COVID didn't help, did it? Looking at mm -hmm. how the government behaved during those years. So, um, you know, a lot's gone really wrong. And what we've exposed in this report will confirm a lot of people's fears as well about the kinds of excesses um, that government might seek during this period. Now with extra laws coming through, um, like the online safety bill, and also several anti-protest laws, there's just more and more and more of it. Um, so the online the online safety bill has been watered down to some degree. I think in no small part because of Big Brother Watch's campaign working mm. with uh, parliamentarians and other um, free speech groups. Um, so now this whole concept that was going to be introduced into law of legal but harmful yeah. speech, which you know I, it always um, sort of gives chills. Really, the idea that there are things that you are lawful to say, but but. But you can't say them, <laughs> yeah. say them anymore, exactly. <laughs> um, which is, yeah, a, a legal mess. Um, but actually, what's come into its place is that um, social media companies' terms and conditions are now a legal duty. So mm -hmm. they will be legally bound, not just as in a contract between the person using it and the company, but actually with the government, they are legally bound to observe those terms and conditions, which given some of the terms and conditions we've seen over the years um, is quite strange. You know, so let's say um, if a platform says that you can't misgender anyone, um, you know, looking at the case that's being discussed at the moment of the Scottish trans uh, woman who is a rapist. <laughs> oh, sorry. Calculation. I yeah. genuinely haven't read loads about the case, but I'm just thinking about yeah, it. Okay, yeah, so yeah. Sc a Scottish trans yes. woman who um, is a Two repeated rapist. rapist. Yeah. Okay, Isla, Isla Graham. Right. Um, you know, would it then would would British law then say if a platform said you can't misgender anyone? Mm. Uh, yes. Would the would then this new construction mean that you can't use the wrong pronouns? for this person on a social media platform according to the government, because the government is making these terms and conditions a legal duty. Mm. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yes. I do. So, you know, when YouTube has crazy rules or, you know, Twitter may less so now, I don't know, but um, yeah, it's strange. Or, or like, you know, Musk not wanting his private jets to be tracked or whatever. If, if that becomes Twitter law, mm. you know, that kind of becomes the law because the government is saying it's now a legal duty that you always impose these laws. So that's a nonsense, but unfortunately no one's talking about it. Mm. Uh, Silky, do you think the only way that people really wake up is when something happens or an event happens that is so powerful or it just strikes the people as something that is completely wrong. So, for instance, the, the one time when we actually changed football stadiums in this country was after the Hillsborough disaster because it was such an awful, awful event. And if you look at the pandemic, the, the moment people woke up when they started to think about, you know, the right to congregate and the right to protest is the police's actions during the Sarah Everard vigil. Do you think we just need something to happen like it? I don't know what it is where people just collectively come to their senses. Maybe, but by then it will be too late. Mm. So my message would be, please don't wait. Please don't be complacent. Um, if you can remember what that feeling was like when we were all told by the government to stay in your home, mm -hmm. weren't sure if we were going to be able to travel again, didn't know when we'd be able to be out, didn't know if normal life was coming back. And of course, you know, a lot of us have fought 
tooth and nail to make sure that it did and that mm. all of these laws were repealed. But there was a sense then, like, is it too late? And I think a lot of people that obviously has, you know, made a lot of people a lot more alive to how precious their liberty is. And I also think if some, if anyone hasn't kind of got it during these couple of years, then you might never, mm. but, you know, please don't be complacent and don't wait because, um, yeah, the, the, you know, we can lose these freedoms. We can lose these liberties really, really quickly, but also the culture shifting, you know, so already the fact that you can sit in an audience of people and they have these really, you know, almost disdain actually for free speech, mm. not even mm. an indifference to it, but actually to, it's been recast as a threat to, to democracy rather than the foundation of it. Mm. Um, then, you know, something's going really, really wrong. How do we come back from that? And I think that's why conversations like these and platforms like these are important because um, this is as much about you know culture and ideas as it is about anything. And people have to really realize now how important these these liberties are. This is why I always say to Americans because they're like, well, how come you, you know like there are certain issues in terms of the cultural stuff that we often mm -hmm. talk about in the show. We're actually in the UK, we're doing much better mm -hmm. uh, than than they are in America, but on speech we're doing far worse. Mm. And they always go, well, is it because of the First Amendment? And I don't think it's because of the First Amendment. I think it's because they have a culture, mm. a First Amendment culture, which is at the end of the day, like anyone can say what they want unless they're mm. inciting violence. We don't have that. Mm. We don't have that. And the pandemic was almost like, I almost, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I think Francis and I were both very disappointed in, in this country, actually, and in many people in this country, because maybe we were projecting our own views and values onto it. But I certainly didn't think that the polling numbers and people's behavior during the pandemic showed that we live in a society that values freedom of expression. Yeah, but it's all relative. I mean, how the UK did compared to the rest of Europe, you know, we did a lot better than a lot of European countries. That's true. Mm. We got rid of the restrictions quicker than anyone else. We didn't have, you know, the EU now has a EU wide super state COVID pass system. Uh, they're introducing biometric borders, you know, so, you know, they've got millions of people enrolled in databases with IDs, digital IDs and passes. And, you know, we're not there. And I think there, there is something about um, perhaps the parliamentary system and our, 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 the, you know, our culture. Um, but I think where the, um, where the vacuum really was, was in the opposition and on the left, um, it, to be honest. And I'm saying that as a non-partisan, you know, we are a non-partisan organization. I say it's from a totally non-partisan point of view. And I should say as well for people, like you genuinely are, like that's yeah. not a thing mm. that you say because you're a right-wing evil bigot. Like you actually, <laughs> you're not power too political, you just care about these issues. Yeah, that's true. And always yeah. have done. Yes, yeah, exactly. Which makes you right-wing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously it makes me a right-wing bigot, yeah. <laughs> oh, come full circle. Um, but yeah, and I think that's why, you know, when we're thinking about mm. next government and, yeah. um, you know, where the currents are going on mm. these issues, um, you know, yeah, it is really worrying. So mm. the, the things like the investigation and, and the campaign that we're running now mm. to shut down the Ministry of Truth, it's an opportunity. It, well, it's an appeal, really. We're, we're, we're trying to create disruption in this current mm -hmm. um, and to try to turn the tide back. Do you have a website or do you plan to have a website? Because if you do, then EasyDNS is a company for you. EasyDNS is the perfect domain name registrar provider and web host for you. They have a track record of standing up for their clients, whether it be cancel culture, de-platform attacks, or overzealous government agencies. He knows about that. So will you in a second. <laughs> Easy DNS have rock solid network infrastructure and fantastic customer support. They're in your corner no matter what the world throws at you. Unless it's your ex-girlfriend. In which case, you're on your own. <laughs> you know about that. <laughs> Move your domains and websites over to Easy DNS right now. All you've got to do is go to easydns.com forward slash triggered. That's easydns.com forward slash triggered. Use our promo code, which is also triggered, and get 50% off the initial purchase. Sign up for their newsletter, Access of Easy, which tells you everything you need to know about technology, privacy, and censorship. 
So what can people do, Silky? Because this is one of my biggest frustrations with doing this, and I'm very proud of what we've built here. Mm -hmm. But quite often we have a conversation, and look, Francis made a great point. Like, okay, we've got a general election coming up. Okay, the Tories are probably going to get kicked out. Now what? Like, what? if I'm watching this, what, what am I supposed to do? How, how am I going to change this? Um, go to minitruth.co.uk. Yeah. Um, which is our campaign page to shut down the Ministry of Truth. We've got a petition that people can sign. Please sign it. Um, sign up to our emails for updates about the campaign because we won't let this go. Um, you know, all we will ask people to do is sign a petition or join us, get mm -hmm. the Ministry of Truth T-shirt. <laughs> um, you know, and just be in, be involved in in the in the campaign. Um, but you know, really talk about it mm. share the information with people share this with people share information with um share the information with people um we i think so much is happening because um politicians think that people just don't care mm. and um particularly on free speech you know these disinformation units misinformation units have popped up because of the moral panic that's been drummed up really about people saying the wrong things online um, and I think we need to see at least a similar force back saying free speech really matters. And actually, even where you are talking about the misinformation online, the best way of dealing with it is with more information, mm -hmm. with more speech. Um, so I think there are things that people can do, definitely. I mean, certainly through campaign groups like ours. And I think the benefit of us do, you know, doing investigations in-house is for, 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 for precisely that reason that, you know, we follow up everything with action um, and we won't drop it until, you know, there has been change. Because it's not only online that we've seen the laws being changed, it's also the right to protest. Mm. The government have, fun, have completely changed the laws. Can you just explain that a little bit? Yes, uh, we've been campaigning on a couple of the anti-protest bills that have been coming through Parliament lately mm -hmm. because of, of course, we've all seen the scenes of people gluing themselves to rows and throwing mm -hmm. things on paintings and all the rest of it. Um, but police already have powers to deal with those things. Mm -hmm. um, but under the pretense of dealing with these people, we're just getting more and more extreme anti-protest powers introduced. And in fact, we are in the process of winning a campaign against GPS ankle tags that the government wants to introduce for um, innocent campaigners, you know, people that haven't even broken the law. If they're what? deemed disruptive, um, you could be fitted with a GPS ankle tag uh, to monitor where you go and make sure that you don't go to well, other protests. Well, you haven't broken the law and they're going to track your movements. Yeah. Yes. And monitor what you do on the internet and, and uh, control what you do on the internet to so make sure you're not doing protest related activities on there either. So basically, if you're if you're an effective campaigner, you will be disruptive in some sense. Right. Um, and this word disruptive is being used to usher in these extraordinary curbs on your right to protest. And this really is the kind of power where I think, e you know, if even the Russians or the Chinese, I'd say, we're going to ankle tag our protesters. You'd be like, wow, they've really gone for it now. You know, like mm. this is really extreme. And this is happening in, in Britain. I mean, that is just, that's, be, that's, that's beyond belief that they're going to yeah. ankle tag people who they claim to be disruptive and who are not guilty of a crime. Yeah, it really is. But I think we're winning this campaign. <laughs> I think that we, I think... I think that we are. The government has said that they're going to maintain some of these powers, but that it seems like they're uh, willing to drop the ankle tags finally, but it's not confirmed right just now. How do they... How, how do you... How do, <laughs> That's wrong yeah. thing. That's a tag for you, yeah, yeah. Constantine. Uh, well, it would just be me walking around my flat, but it's... How do you, and, and coming here, that's about all I do nowadays. But how do you, how, how do they sit in government and come up with these ideas? Like, have they not read Orwell? Like, does it not occur to They've them? They've read Orwell. They're following the script very closely. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it, doesn't it? Yeah, but just with the benefits of technology. Mm. You know, so this is like a high tech dystopia. Um, which is, you know, the blueprint is China. If you look mm. at how closely you can be followed and tracked. Um, let alone through an ankle tag, you know, things like facial recognition, surveillance, which the police are using more and more now. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, again, and this stuff can only happen in, in an environment where people are not protecting their rights closely mm. enough, where, where people are, are, have lost sight of how important it is to be able to protest against your government. And also, you know, if the pe other people who are in parliament, in opposition, are not speaking up loudly enough about these things, the reason that they won't is because they're is because the press is so anti-protest at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and so this really safe line is being followed of just a, kind of allowing the government to self-implode. Um, and well, look, I am an, I am anti-extinction rebellion gluing themselves and blocking ambulances. But it, as you said, there are laws in place for the yeah. police to deal with protests mm -hmm. that are actually endangering lives or damaging property and whatever. And I'm perfectly happy for those laws to be applied, but I don't want those people ankle tagged if they haven't broken the law. Yeah. I'd quite like the existing laws to be enforced though, which we don't do any of that on protests and anything else, by the way. But instead, we just make up new laws to, to deal with other things. It was like the, the David Ames murder last year, where the guy tragically is stabbed to death by an Islamist. And then they're all banging on about online hate speech. And you're going, these things aren't connected, but we seem to just go, you know, whatever the problem is, let's take some people, some of people's rights away from them. Yeah, it's really lazy, isn't it? Um, and also, I think particularly around policing, we're overlooking the fact that the um, police, particularly in London, are totally dysfunctional. Mm. You know, they, they, they cannot, they're committing more crimes than they're solving. I mean, they just cannot deal with, um, you know, even th these most basic uh, public order issues or, or even serious crime or really anything. And so the easiest thing for government to do is to just whack through a bunch of new extraordinary powers and then say, we've been really tough. Mm. Um, but the same things will happen because where powers already exist, they're not being used, mm -hmm. um, you know. And why is that happening? Why, why aren't the police using the powers? Because they're they totally dysfunctional. And why, why under, resource, under resource, I mean, I, I, this is like a big conundrum at the moment, isn't it? How do you deal, especially with the Metropolitan Police, like how is it so fatally broken policing in London that we have really high crime, um, terrible sexual violence as well, um, and literally thousands of police officers under investigation as well for, for some of these crimes. I mean, something really, really has gone wrong there and probably a lack of political leadership as well and mm. um, that that's been allowed to happen and that what's being thrown at the problem is more police powers. Mm -hmm. Now that's, that, that just doesn't make sense. Um, and I fear the problem will get worse before it gets better until you have proper political leadership on it. I was going to say there was one more thing that the government brought in during the pandemic that made my blood run cold, which was they wanted to implement some powers against journalists. Do you remember what this was, the, what actually happened with that? So much has happened. I, don't so know. I mean, I know that a lot of journalists were arrested and manhandled by police during this time. Um, and actually, coming back to these anti-protest laws, mm. um, one of the new anti-protest bills that has come into force um, has already been used. Mm. Um, there was uh, an LBC journalist that was arrested for yes. covering mm. Extinction Rebellion. Mm. Um, yeah, for, I think it was conspiracy to cause a public nuisance, um, which they were basing on the fact that she may have known that the protest was going to take place. So now journalists are kind of seen as like proxy spies for... The police, you know, which goes to show, I think, the risks of uh, introducing extreme powers. You can't just say, well, they probably won't be used like all the other ones. So they will be and sometimes in the worst circumstances. Um, so, the, you know, these anti-freedom um, laws will affect um, journalists and the whole kind of civil society that's supposed to prop up democracy. Silky. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Have it's, I cheered you up? Yes, you have, <laughs> massively. He, he loves a bit of yeah. depressiveness. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, doom and gloom, it's all shit. Have it confirmed, fabulous. But no, thank you so much for coming. It was an absolutely brilliant interview. If people want to find out about your amazing work online, what is the best way to do that? How can they join um, the struggle? Yes, well, this is the good part that we're doing mm. something about it. So um, bigbrotherwatch.org.uk. We're on Twitter as well, at Big Brother Watch. 
uh, we're on YouTube, we'd rather watch HQ. Um, and this particular campaign page is at minitruth.co.uk in true Orwellian style. And uh, Silky, keep up the good work because you are, it's very important And this investigation you've done, by the time this goes out, it, hope for, I, I'm, I'm hopeful it's exploded everywhere. You've got a, it's coming out in the mail on Sunday and you've got a bunch of interviews coming up and I hope this contributes to it. So thanks for coming back. Thank well you. done on, on what you're doing. And thank you guys for watching and listening. If you want to see uh, a couple of bonus questions that uh, our supporters have already submitted and hear the answers to them, join our locals. We will see you there. And for those of you who like your trigonometry on the go, always remember that it's available as a podcast. Take care and see you soon, guys. People in tech, myself included, tend to always make the false assumption that all progress will only be used for good. Do you think politicians have the necessary grasp of technology? I mean, we know the answer to that. And its potential negative implications for privacy, or are they too often blinded by positivity from tech companies?